Good evening, everybody. Uh, turn with me to Romans chapter 5. We're, we'll, we'll be in there for a little bit because there's a lot of information in here. Romans chapter 5. And uh, we're going to look at 3 and 4. Well, actually, yeah, 3 and 4. But we can go back to 2. We might as well go back to 2. By whom also we have access by faith into his grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation, also knowing that tribulation worketh patience, patience experience, and experience hope. Uh, Lord, we just thank you for tonight. We thank you for everybody being here. We ask a very special blessing on them that you'll meet each and every one of us. And that, Lord, you'll just encourage our hearts uh, as we partake of your word. Cause us to grow up in you with a greater understanding of who you are and what you have for our lives. And so we just thank you that you are God and we praise you. And we just say this in your name. Amen. Now, we've been talking about the Christian life. Um, most of the time when you're in church, what they talk about is your salvation. But your salvation is the beginning of your Christian life. Uh, salvation is your starting point, And then from that point on, you have to work out your salvation. And what really saves you is the life of Christ. So what you're doing is you're working out the life of Christ. You're, you're trying to work it in you as you work it out. And so that's why the Philippians uh, 2.12 tells us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. That's what it's talking about. It's working out the life of Christ. A lot of people don't understand eternal life. Well, we think eternal life is something we, we're going to get in the end. No, eternal life is in you already if Christ is in you. And so you're trying to work out that Christian life. That's why they call it Christianity, because it goes back to Christ. And it talk, uh, Christianity is an active, it's just not a, a title, it's an active word. That something's being worked in, worked out, and, and that it's a process. So when people, all they talk about salvation, they're not doing you any good. If you're saved, you need to know what it means to go on and really get a hold of that life for yourself because it is the life. So we have access to the heavenly eternal because of Jesus and his redemption. Now this life is founded on Christ. It's declared uh, that life in you uh, declares you're justified uh, it's supplied with faith, it shows grace, and it possesses hope. And as believers, we have it all. We don't act like we have it all, but we do have it all. We just have not learned how to uh, access it, as they would say, to get into it, to allow it to get into us. And so that's the problem with a lot of Christians. Uh, most of their salvation, their their salvation experience turns into stagnant pools because they don't go on and allow that life of Christ through the Holy Spirit to stir up that water and to refresh them and to lead them and to inspire them. And so they often get what they say bored with Christianity. And if, if you're getting bored of Christianity, it's not because Christianity has failed you. It's because somewhere along the line you have fail to understand what Christianity is all about. And I don't blame that on usually the people. I blame it on the leaders, the teachers, because they should be teaching you this. And so the problem is that Christianity oftentimes is presented in a false light, whether it's a man-made religion or her heretical teaching or the fact that you're, if you're a Christian, you're immune from the challenges of life. And... You're talking about being in, immune in an imperfect world. Good luck with that. You know, this is an imperfect world. And things are going to happen to you. And the problem is that a lot of people who are saved and have had experience with Christ, they're not prepared to walk it out because they don't understand it's a life. It's a life. You have to live it. You have to experience it. Life is meant to live and experience your environment. 
They say life, the definition of life is one of them, is your ability to interact with your environment. And the reason why you need to be born again is because it gives you the ability to interact with God. Because you can't interact with him in the flesh. You have to be in the spirit to interact with him. So you have to have the life of Christ in you to interact with God. And so that's what it's all about. And so you have a physical life, you inter interact with this world, but without the, uh, the born-again experience, you can't interact with God. That's the, that's the important part of it. Now, uh, I rarely hear or see, and I have to admit this, uh, that the Christian life, I rarely hear and see it being presented in, in, a, in, in the right way. Because they don't use the whole word of God. They use bits and pieces that serve their purpose. But they don't really show you from the word of God what this life means. So much of the false gospels of today are geared towards the world's emphasis, philosophies, and pursuits. And that's what we have sort of adopted. We have, uh, and someone really described it this way, we have made... Christianity, a culture within a culture. A culture basically uh, determines your attitude and lifestyles. Christianity is your life. It's not a lifestyle. It is your life. It's the very life of Christ in you. And Christianity was not meant to become a culture in, inside of a culture. It was meant to stand distinct because you're part of an unseen kingdom that is eternal. You're here to affect people in an eternal way. That's why we're called ambassadors of Christ. Ambassadors is, ambassador in our government is the highest official in a foreign country. They have a lot of power. And it shows that we're in a foreign country as Christians. We're representing Christ. We have a tremendous position in Christ. And a lot of times we don't think about that. But the Bible is very clear about some of those things. Now, we are promised eternal life, people, but we're also told we're going to experience tribulation. Now, that is not what we want to hear. Okay? But it is the way it is. We will experience tribulation because we are in this world. Period. Now, who's the god of this world? Satan. And what that means, he's the god of the systems. You have to understand that. God is the god of the universe. But Satan is the, the originator. He's the one behind all the systems that you see are anti-God. And if they aren't, they eventually become. Your educational system is Satan's system. The government system is Satan's system. The justice system is Satan's system. And we wonder why there's no fairness. We wonder why we have this indoctrination into hell itself by our educational system. Because it's under Satan. Now God owns the cattle, right? On a thousand hills or how's that go? Yeah. But you know what, what, what Satan has done? Because everything you see in creation is God. He has taken those cattle on a thousand hills. He has taken them captive and put them in his system so he can control you. And that's what he's done. They're not his. But he ha he's, he's the robber. He's the killer. He's the destroyer. And so that's what he, does. he has done. That cattle's for all of us. But no, Satan's taking it. And he says, okay, you have to sell your soul to have it. So what we are coming up to get against, we should be surprised, is Satan's systems. You say, well, where's the justice? You're not going to see the justice. Well, where's, where's the sanity? You're not going to see the sanity. It's Satan's systems. And the more corrupt people become in those systems, and those systems are geared up, please hear me, those systems are geared up, and, and, and the goal of people in those systems is, I'm going to beat the system. So what most people are doing is they think, okay, I'm using the system and Satan, and Satan's laughing at them. 
Okay, he just thinks they're a joke. I'm using their system. He says, okay, go ahead and use it. Jeanette had a, a she, she doesn't want to admit he's a stepbrother. He's long gone past and he's probably in hell. He used to think he was the Messiah all the time. But he was, he was a man that he got rich at times. I mean, he got tremendously rich. Satan would just enrich him and then he would pull the rug out from underneath him and he'd be poor. And that's how Satan is. That's how he works with his little cronies. He sets them up for absolute failure so he can mock them for the fools they are. And that's what happens to many when Satan's wet, ready to take him to hell. He's mocking them. The demons are mocking them as they take him to hell. That's, that's the reality of Satan's kingdom. Man never beats the system. Eventually the system will turn around and say, gotcha. And they always get caught. They always get caught. But that's how it all works out there. Some of you probably know that. You have, hopefully, I don't think anybody has fallen into that system. But we're promised eternal life, people. But we're also told we will experience this, this tribulation because we're in this world. But guess what? If you're in Christ, you're not going to, you're not going to be subject to the wrath to come. And you have to understand the wrath is upon all the world that's being held back right now and one day it's going to come it's going to come and it's going to consume the world and anybody that is basically in the path of it uh, john the baptist told uh, the people of his generation that was two thousand years ago he says flee the wrath to come because it's coming god's wrath is coming upon all the face of the earth and anybody who doesn't know him and that and we need to flee that so, as Christians, we've been guaranteed the storehouse of God's abundance, but we have been also told we're going to experience sorrow, we're going to experience toil and despair in our life here. And people are shocked when they have great toil and despair. We're told we're going to experience that. Why? Because when Adam blew it in the garden, man came under a curse. And that's the curse. Toil. Sorrow. You can go back. It's in chapter 3 of Genesis. Everything we're experiencing is part of the curse. But you know what? It says in Galatians 3 that Jesus became a curse for us, so we don't have to be subject to that any longer. We don't have to live under that curse. But if you insist on living according to the world, guess what? You're going to come under that curse. You're going to come under that curse. I want you to know something about God never curses you. Who curses you is yourself. Because every time you come under something that is contrary to God, you're bringing yourself from underneath his blessings into a curse. And so you have things going on in your life. And you say, why is this going on? There's no blessings. Well, that's one of the reasons. Because you brought yourself under the curse. So you're going to toil. You're going to, you're going to have this big struggle in your life. That's how it works. Now at the core of, uh, of life, of course, we have this tribulation. Please hear me. It's often a time of purging and refinement and pre preparation for us. That's what it is. But at the core of life, please hear me, is tragedy. You're not going to get around it. Because at the core of life, it's loss. And at the core of life is death. And so you're, you're going to suffer loss. You're going to suffer sorrow. You're going to suffer all these things. It's a tragedy. What happened in the garden was a tragedy. You know what the greatest tragedy was? Man broke fellowship with God. That was a tragedy. That was the tragedy. And, and he came out from underneath God's protection. And as a result... He came under the domain of Satan. Because you have to understand, man had a domain. And when he sinned against God, he turned it over to Satan. And so there's just so much going on. Because you, you have to serve some kind of master. We are here to serve a master. Hopefully everyone here is serving the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now, as Christians, we have this access to that which brings contrast, that of love, joy, peace, and hope. It's a way into a new life in which life is gained, hope relies, and the future secured. You can't say that about the world. You can't say it about the world. Now, there are three types of suffering. We talked about it, corrective, constructive, and exemplary suffering. But suffering is for the purpose of lining us up to holiness. It's, it's to knock out the silliness and ultimately cause our lives to prove exceptional, making us a witness of Christ. That's the beauty of it. So let's look at five now and it says and hope hope maketh not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us now you look at patience and patience is experience or actually it's the experience that you have that brings you through the process of where you Gain patience so you can have hope. <laughs> that doesn't make sense, right? It really does. Because you're not going to possess hope, the promises, without patience. Okay? And you can't trust that hope. You can't endure the, the temptations without that hope. And you're looking towards that hope. You are lining everything up to that hope. Because that's the only thing... It's going to make sense in the world today. Now, there's things that we can do. We can have fun. But there's nothing. When you really look at the world, especially as it's getting worse, nothing makes sense but God. And that's something I had to understand in my life. Nothing makes sense but God. You see, there's a couple of things that you learn. One is there is a God. Please know that. And Jeanette used to wear this T-shirt, by the way. Two things I know. One, there's a God. Two, you ain't him. But I add three things. A third thing. That nothing makes sense outside of God. This world, our purpose, everything. It doesn't make sense outside of God. Now, there are three parts to this scripture you really need to look at. Three parts. You think, oh, wow, okay, three parts to this scripture. <laughs> okay. There are three. And we're going to look at the, the root of this scripture. What is the root here? You can't understand the other things without understanding the root of, a, of what he's saying here. There is one root here. Most people would look at it and say, oh, well, let's see. Oh, it's talking about love. That must be the root. No, it's not. The root is the Holy Spirit. He's the root here. You can talk about everything else, but it's really the Holy Spirit because who sheds that love abroad in your hearts? It's the Holy Spirit. He's the root here, and the others are the outpouring of the fruits of it. Now, the Spirit is the breath of life. He's the breath of life. Spirit means breath. <sighs> breath. Whenever you talk about spirit, that's what it is. It's just the breath. So because you are breathing the air in this world, you're able to interact. Breath is taking in in order to interact with the world around you. If you, all you did was inhale, how would that work for you? And you didn't exhale. You'd be dead. There has to be that action. Well, the Holy Spirit is God's breath. He's God's breath. He produces the love of God in us. And we have hope because the Holy Spirit identifies us to our creator. There's no hope outside of our creator. Now, the main ingredient of the fruit of the Spirit is love. You can look at that in Galatians. We all know the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit, not fruits. Fruit. Out of love comes the other eight characteristics, 
which is followed by joy, peace, and so forth. Without love, the love of God, you could not have those other fruits because love, I should say, ingredients, because love works in and through those ingredients. You cannot be kind without love. You can't have faith without love. You can't have joy without love. You can't have peace without love. Love is the, is the uh, tremendous uh, point of which all things come out, but you've got to have the root. You have to have the root. And that's the Holy Spirit. Now, it's the lasting fruit that springs out of the love of God, but you, it's, it's that root that you have to get back to. It says, if you do not have the Spirit, you will never possess the love of God. Because you can't have that love without God. You see, you have your own love. I one time looked up love in the Greek. A word for it is fond, fondness for something. There were so many different things that people could have a tremendous fondness for that you, it, was, it took up the, the word love and all the fondness it had took up uh, more than a page, I think, of just going through it. You have a love for wisdom. You have a love for this. You have a love for that. Okay, we can go on and on. But God's love is more than that. It's one of the deepest commitments you can have. It gives you that ability to make a commitment and see it all the way through no matter what happens to you. If you don't believe me, look at the cross. That's God's love. It went all the way to the cross for you. That's an important thing. Now, there's a prayer, and I want to read it to you because it's very simple. It says, fill me with life anew, that I may love what thou dost love, and do what thou would do. O breath of love, come breathe within me, renewing thought and will and hear, come. Love of Christ afresh to win us. Revive thy church in every part. Without that godly love, there's no inspiration, commitment, desire, preference. Because it's what the love you have. Why do you prefer that person you prefer? Because you love them. And with godly love, we prefer God. We prefer God. And that's an important thing. Now, the Holy Spirit is usually some name or term that's used to describe, and when you talk to people, some vague notion or some force or some power. I'm going to tell you something surprising. The Holy Spirit is a person. Now, what distinguishes a person from a force? Personality. They have an actual personality that you can know them personally. There's three things that, per, that really determines your personality. It's your will. It's one. You have a will. The Holy Spirit has a will. He has a personality. He, he can be vexed. He has feelings. He can be grieved. All these things. So these three things, feelings, okay, and will. What was the third thing I said? It was right there. It went out of my mind. That's terrible. Anyway, feelings, will, and thoughts. He's actually uh, making decisions. He's actually in there interacting, okay? He's interacting with us. But most people think that he's some force out there. He's some name out there. Well, we really don't quite understand the Holy Spirit. Uh, in fact... He is one of the things that causes the most conflict. The subject of the Holy Spirit causes the most conflict among denominations. In fact, uh, back in Constantine's time, the church went different ways. It went west and east because of the subject of the Holy Spirit. And it's true today causes the same type of division. Why? Because people don't know what the Word says about the Holy Spirit. 
They've been given an interpretation or idea, and that's how they interpret everything they read about the Holy Spirit. Instead of going to the Bible without their own ideas and saying, Lord, what do you want me to see about the Holy Spirit? Because that's what I did. See, I had a Baptist background. And in the Baptist belief, they say, well, uh, and when it comes to gifts, it ceased because we have the Word of God. When, when you really read that, it says, when that which is perfect comes, the gifts will cease. It's not the Word of God, it's Christ himself, okay, that it, the Bible's talking about. But they made it read the Word of God. And so they say, well, we have the Word of God, we don't need the gifts. Really? How's that working for you? And so this great conflict, in fact, uh, you know, the, the Baptists are so scared of the Holy Spirit, they think it's a demon. And on the other side, you have the others that are cuckoo and they do have a demon, demon okay? It's not the Holy Spirit. So this is why there's such a, a, a confusing uh, mess. But if you study the Word of God, it would take away all that because... The, whole, the, the Lord lays out who the Holy Spirit is. You need to know him for yourself. You need to know how to discern him. You need to know how he works so you can see whether he's working or not. So you can see if you need to receive what's happening or you run away from it. But you need that discernment because we need the Holy Spirit today. We need his gifts to operate so we know what's going on. We need those different words of wisdom or prophecy or knowledge so that God can minister to us personally. And we can't throw it out. I was talking to a lady the other day. I don't know. We were talking, and she had totally seen the abuse of the Holy Spirit, and so she wasn't even going to go there. And I said, do you know what's happening to you because the Holy Spirit wants to minister to you right now, and you won't go there? You won't go there. You won't let him show you. You won't let him use you because of this experience over there. You get in that Bible and you know it for yourself and you come out with, with God's understanding of the Holy Spirit and how he works in our life. We need to quit fighting over this. He's not a vague notion or force or a power. In fact, the Holy Spirit is quiet for the most part. And yet, he does the greatest work in you and me. He's quiet, yet he does the greatest work in the church today. And we don't even know it. We don't understand it. So let's look at this for a minute. He is the breath of God. He is eternal. It is said, God never in health. He only exhales on you and I. He doesn't breathe like you and I. He gives. And so what he gives is that breath, his breath, which comes with a life, hope, and power. It's the breath of God that revives the spirit within us and the presence of God that transforms the soul with a new heart and a new life. He is the presence of God in you. That's why we're called the Holy, uh, the Holy Temple. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit because the Spirit, which is the presence and breath of God, resides within us. I want you to think about that. God's very breath and presence resides in you. Now, that's pretty much a high calling, if you look at it. And so let's look at what it says in Titus 3, 5. This is where a lot of people uh, understand sort of the importance of the Holy Spirit, what he does. It's a very simple scripture. A lot of people uh, read it. I probably didn't give you Titus, did I? Sorry. 3, 5. Uh, but I'll read it to you, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Now listen to this, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. He has washed us 
In other words, he's regenerated us. He has brought forth new life like springtime. You know, after spring, that dormant winter season, and then all of a sudden, things start coming out. That's what regeneration is. And that's what he does in our life. He regenerates it. He brings that life, that new life of Christ out in us. And so what you see is it points to a new creation coming forth. That's what it points to. Every time a flower, you know, goes back and the seed goes dormant, it produces a new life. We don't quite understand that, but that's what it does. It produces a whole new life. And that's what God does through his Holy Spirit in us. He produces a whole new life in us. Now, he produces tender buds in preparation to display the leaves, the flowers, and fruit. The leaves reveal the abundance of the life we have in Christ, the flower, the beauty, and fragrance of that life. And the fruit, now that fruit, it is powerful. And you know what else about that fruit? It is meant to reproduce itself. And same likeness. In other words, produce new creations. You have to know that Christ is the first fruit of a new creation. He's talking about us. And we have that life in us, and that life is meant to reproduce itself in other people, the life of Christ. And it's all in us. Can you imagine that? I think, boy, God, you sure you want to uh, use us that way? I mean, I would. Try to find something better than me anyway. Now, not only are we new creations, we are part, and this is so important. We talked about this morning at Bible study. We are part of a new family. We are part of a universal family. Okay? Now that we have fights with each other, yes. But we are part of a family. Do you understand that? So many people feel rejected, left behind by their earthly families. But when they come to Christ, they are put into a new family. Now, Romans 8. I have to go back to Romans 8. I told you I would take you back there. Romans 8. 8 through 17. 8 through 17, that sounds like a lot, but you'll see why it's important to go there. Now, you could read this whole chapter. It's, in, it's an incredible chapter. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Notice that if you're living in the flesh, if the Spirit of God's not in you, you can't please God. But if you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you, now, if any man have not the Spirit of God, he is none of his. You don't belong to him, is what he's saying. It's that simple. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit of life because of righteousness. You have a whole new life. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus, I want you to notice it says the Spirit raised up Christ. What do you think he can do in your life? If he raised Christ up from the dead, he can raise you up in a powerful way. Now, <clears throat> let me see if I can find where I am. There I am. Okay. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. Therefore, brethren... We are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh, you shall live. Now here's the big part. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. They are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. There's no reason to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together. 
So what we have here is we're part of a new family. It's a spiritual family. Now we are, uh, we are connected by the blood of Christ, okay? That's blood relationship, if you want to call it that. But it's the spirit in us. It's a life in us that connects us to each other. It's the breath of God in us that connects us to each other and allows us to interact with each other. Now, I want you to go to Galatians 4. Galatians 4. I'm going to look at something here. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage of the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, meaning Christ, God sent forth his son, made of woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive, what? The adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant but a son, if a son than an heir of God through Christ. Now, let me explain something. In the Roman culture, our adoptions are different than the Roman culture. Every child born in the Roman culture, culture were automatically considered servants, slaves. That's what they were. And they said what they had to do to, for someone to be an heir, like their oldest son, they'd have to take them to the court and actually adopt them so they could become heirs. It put them out of a whole different situation. So what is he saying here? He's saying that you were born servants and slaves, but guess what? Because of what I did on the cross, because you have the Holy Spirit now, you have the official documentation that you are now a child of God. No longer a servant, but heirs. How important is that? Now, the, the Father has placed us in Jesus, and through the presence of his Spirit, Christ is in us. It's two ways. We are in Christ, hidden, and he is in us, empowering. His life is being, is being formed in us, so his image can come forth. That's what it's all about. Now, we have been placed... In a new family by the Holy Spirit, if the Spirit's not present, then there's no means in which to identify you to the family. You know, when people go around and say, oh, I said the sinner's prayer, where's the evidence that you're part of a new family? Because that's what it says. Where's the evidence? Now, without the Spirit, there is no seal that speaks of your official adoption into the heavenly family and no means to identify you as an heir to the inheritance. We're talking about eternal inheritance here. Now, as a new creation, we are meant to take on the likeness of Christ. But you say, how? Well, consider what Jesus said about this relationship in Matthew 12. So we're going to go to Matthew 12. We're going to look at 46 through 50. While he yet talked to the people, this is Jesus, behold, his mother, his brethren, stood without desiring to speak with him. This is talking about his physical brethren, his mother, of course, Mary. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. Now you would think, because they were his family, he would say, Oh, let them through. That's what they expected him to say. He said something quite contrary, though. So I want you to look at what he said. But he answered and said unto him that told him, who is my mother and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand towards his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of my father, which is in heaven, the same 
is my brother and sister and mother. It comes down to us lining up to the will of God. That's the purpose of the Holy Spirit. In order to conform us in our, the family likeness of Christ, we have to line up to the will of the Father. And then we will become identified to him as part of his family. Now that's all quite different than what most people would think. Now we must note, uh, I must note, there are many groups in this family we're talking about. The Holy Spirit worked among the saints of old. He was there in the Old Testament. From Adam to Abraham, they believed the promises. Okay, whoever believed the promises from Adam to Abraham were identified to the coming of the inheritance that would be uh, re wrought through Christ. Okay, and then when it came to um, Israel, it was anybody who identified themselves to the covenants. Okay, they became part of the covenant or the promise. But for, for you and I, it's a little different. Because you have to remember, we are in what they call a dispensation of grace. And what we are, are made up, we make up the family of God, which is the church, the body, the bride of Christ. We make up that uh, organization, well, I don't call it organization, it's actually a body. It's a living body. We make it up. Every believer makes this body up. Now, in the old, the Holy Spirit came upon man, moved on, moved through, and inspired. But in the New Testament, he indwells man who serves as his temple. Big difference. Now, we are baptized by the Spirit and unified into one body. This is very important. And he serves as the glue in that body that holds us together. Now, it's in baptism done by the Holy Spirit, we become identified to Christ. Now, Christ talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He said, John even, you know, it was mentioned that one greater than he would baptize people with fire. He's talking about the Holy Spirit that Jesus would baptize us with the Holy Spirit. Now, there's this big old conflict about it. You know, there's this, oh, well, when you say that happens. Well, you're given, please hear me, the Holy Spirit's referred to as the gift and a promise. He's two things in Scripture. They often ignore that. When we are born again, we're given the gift of the Holy Spirit by the Father. He comes in and he indwells us. But he's also the promise. Now remember, the promise had conditions. And as a promise, it comes in the form of baptism. You're being baptized with the Holy Spirit. Baptism means total immersion of and in the Holy Spirit. So it comes in, he lives into your spirit, comes into your spirit. All of a sudden, uh, the Lord wants to baptize you. So what happens is that the water from within, the Holy Spirit, comes up this way, and the water from above comes down this way, and you're totally immersed in it. <coughs> Excuse me. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What is the purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? To empower you. To empower you, to be a witness, to empower you, to carry out your calling, to empower you. That's the purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The giving you the Holy Spirit as a gift is to give you life, eternal life. But to baptize you is to give you the promise of power from above. Now, people don't get this right. They get scared. <gasps> what if we don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Hey, you know, sorry. You know where the people were when they were baptized? Now, they had already received the Holy Spirit. How do I know? Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. That's in John. He's there. 
But they're waiting, they're tearing for what? The baptism of the Holy Spirit. It was promised. How was it promised? In Job. That's when it was promised. Job promised it. And Peter repeated it. I want you to look at me with that in Acts 2. You can also read it in Joel 2, 28, 29. Acts 2. This is the promise of the Holy Spirit. Not the gift, the promise of the Holy Spirit. Those two things have to be acknowledged and recognized. Acts 2. Let me look at 16 and 18. From this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it came to pass, and it shall come to pass, and the last day said, God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, and on my servants and on my handmaids I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Now this is, this is promised in Joel. It's a promise. And it happened on the day of Pentecost. And guess what? He still wants to pour out his spirit. He still wants to do great works in his church. He still wants to show himself mighty through his people. That has not changed. What has changed is man wants to organize and try to control the Holy Spirit. He wants to dictate to the Holy Spirit. He wants to feel comfortable with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not going to always let you feel comfortable because he's trying to get your attention, okay? He's trying to stir you up because the Holy Spirit has a lot of work to do in us, you know? He's, first of all, uh, he's our counselor. He gives wisdom. He guides and leads us. He purchases us as fire, as water. He renews us. And he's the source of all true inspiration. And he's the power you need to be effective in all ministry. You can't, you can't do it without him. So when it comes to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, there's this big old conflict and you know, all this fear and all, oh, they get mad and they get self-righteous and all this stuff. Go to the word. He hasn't changed. God doesn't change. His spirit doesn't change. Guess what? What his spirit is doing in the church today, his spirit did in the Old Testament too. You can go back there and look. He gave gifts. He did all kinds of things in the Old Testament. He hasn't changed. Now, it's true, we have to be born again, but we're given that gift of spirit upon salvation. We're sealed until the fullness of our redemption is realized, but Jesus is always talking about sending forth, pouring out his promise of power and authority and the ability to do what you need to do. That's what he's talking about, and people are missing it today. The spirit is a water of heaven, that sanctifies us, renews our inner man, and transforms our minds. Father talked about, all you have to do is ask. And when he was talking about, he's saying, if you ask. He's talking about asking for more of God. Anytime you ask for more of God, he's going to give you more of his spirit. So don't be surprised. But you can hinder the spirit by saying, well, I have to understand you. Well, you're just closing him down. Well, I'm not comfortable with this. Uh, well, okay. He's a gentleman. He won't force anything on you. Well, I sort of like this gift and that gift because that gift scares me. Guess what? He's probably going to give you the gift that scares you. Because you have to rely on him. You have to throw yourself on him and say, is this really from you? I don't want to look stupid. You know, I don't want to say something wrong. I mean, I've been there. Because you can be trusted with it. You see, if you get arrogant about a gift, you just perverted it. 
when you're uncertain about like, okay, God, here I am, but I don't have to. I'm a little nervous. You know, I've been there. He said, I'm going to use you because you're a good candidate. You're going to know it's for me and not you. And that's how he works. Do we like it? Not necessarily, okay? He does. When you get baptized with the Holy Spirit, he just doesn't come into your spirit. He fills you up every area of your life with himself and overflows in your life. And all you have to do is ask more of him. That's why Paul instructs us to be filled up daily by this water of the Spirit. So how much the Spirit works in your life, okay? He works the life of Christ in you depends on how full you are of the Spirit. So the more you give way to him, and it's not fun, because it's very nerve-wracking. I have to tell you that because you're like, I don't know what to expect. I don't know what to do. I mean, it's that way. But can you trust him? Can you trust God, the spirit in, his spirit in your life? I can. You know, a lot of times people say, you need to straighten so-and-so up. I said, what does that person say? Well, yeah, I'm going to trust the spirit in that person, the Holy Spirit in that person, because the Holy Spirit knows what to do. With that person. I don't know what to do with that person. I can't change that person, but the Holy Spirit can. You know what makes me mad? All these little Holy Spirits running out, around out there. Trying to tell us how to think. Trying to straighten us up. Trying to change us. Because they can't trust the Holy Spirit in people's lives. And he is the most trustworthy person I know. Is the Holy Spirit. I trust him in your life. Well, so-and-so has a problem. But I trust the Spirit in their life. Their heart's tender. You know, he'll get them there. He'll get them there. He'll get them there uh, based on who they are and where they're at. He understands it. My question is, what does he want to do with you? You know? You're so busy trying to straighten that person up. You know, uh, the Lord showed me a long time ago. You know, I want this person the same way, this way, and that way, and then... When, he got, when I got through, he says, that person doesn't, couldn't even, even exist. That person is not even perfect. That person has to be supernatural and beyond any kind of expectations that we have. It's not realistic. The Holy Spirit's trustworthy. That's what I want you to know tonight. He's trustworthy. How much we give way to him obey what is true, follow after what is right, and never sell for less because we don't have to with the Holy Spirit. But yet we do because we don't understand. How important is the Spirit to each of us as believers? Well, may I say this? He's a full mill deal. Why look anywhere else? Why seek after anything else? He is a full mill deal and God Gave him to you as a gift. He, is, he alone is the only one who can shed abroad in our hearts godly love. He has been given to us as a gift of life and a promise of authority and power. There will be no excuse why Christians fail to hit their high calling. It's not going to be God's fault. Because he's given you the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit sanctifies, empowers, enables, and does a real lasting work in our lives and in the lives of others. That's why he's here. And so, tonight if you say, hey, there's something missing in my life and I don't quite know. What you say is, I need more of the Spirit. And you need to go to God and say, I need more of the Spirit. Prepare me or do whatever you have to. Because I'm going to tell you something. This is something I learned. The key of receiving more of the Spirit, get yourself out of the way. 
Because too many times we're like that full ketchup bottle. Have you ever taken a full ketchup bottle, put them under the water and see how much that water fills that ketchup bottle? It doesn't. And the more we're full of self, the less the Spirit can fill us. Get yourself out of the way and let God fill you. That's the key. And once you do that, you will have a liberty to discover things about God you could never imagine. You will have a freedom in your life to know what joy is all about. And for the first time you say, you know what, I had these moments of happiness, but there's nothing like this joy. And there's times that you've had quiet and calmness in your life. But when you have the Spirit, you'll have the peace of God in your life. And it passes all understanding. That's the beauty of the Holy Spirit. That's what he does for us. He's that breath. He's the breath of heaven, the breath of God.